you take it away. Welcome everyone to today's Designing Dialogue. We have the great honor to have Gaetano Pache today. Um, it will be a 45 minutes conversation followed by 15 minutes Q&A. So if you have any questions for Gaetano, please type them down in the chat box uh, in lower right hand, I think. Um, let's turn to Glenn Adamson. Thank you very much, Lucy. Gaetano, welcome to Design and Dialogue. It is such an honor to have you with us, the maestro. Yeah, yeah, I don't know, he's on my side. Thank you. <laughs> so, nice and, to uh, see you, Glenn. And you, and you. And we also have with you your uh, assistant, Elisa Ronsky. And Elisa, Elisa, can you just show yes. us... Hi, oh. Hi, Elisa. Can you just show <laughs> us Gaetano's work? Because okay. this gives a Look sense of how... Go to the table. So this is where Gaetano has been working. He's been making models of tables, ideas. This is a stool that I'm sure he can talk about it. I'll bring over some of the models so that he can demonstrate. Yeah, this is where he's been working very, very busily for the past few months during quarantine. Three months. Three months. Oh, very nice. Well, and, those of you who are listening, I think Al Iber from Miami is listening, Gaetano, and uh, please do what Al has just done, which is to say where you are tuning in from. And if you have any questions for Gaetano, we already had quite a few entered beforehand. Uh, please let us know in the chat box. Let me that towel for a So the story is, uh, can, I, can I say, Glenn, can I say? Yeah. Please. So today, I believe, is uh, 96 days that I am home. And it's a pleasure because it's, the time goes very fast. The work is very coming very easily. I am very concentrated. And so the idea comes also very fresh. And so I have uh, something like a table, a table as a portrait. Uh, you see it or not? Yes. Fantastic, yeah. This is for, this is for a, someone in London. Then this is a singer that wants a low table. So this is a low table. Then I remember a certain moment that when I was eight or 10 years old, I made a stool. And this is, so I, I, by memory, I remake uh, this foldable seat. So this is another thing. Then I thought about the lamp as a, the angel. The uh, wings. The wind. And so this is just a little sketch at the beginning. And one day, one day this will be a lamp. And the title is uh, The Angel Left. Mm. And this is a problem with our time eventually. And this is another story of Italian, Italy, that someone asked me to do a puzzle to make in a million of copy, and people can con con connect uh, the pieces. And, uh, and uh, is it like a, a, a game or whatever you want to call it? It's made with different fabrics. And it's done with different fabrics because the person who is paying for that is a manufacturer of uh, clothing. clothing. And this is an onion, a lamp. And there are much more, like the drawing of uh, this separate, I call that. A room divider. A room divider, a company very important in Italy asked me to do a project of a room divider and th those are, the, the, the beginning of the sketch. You see different kinds of things. And uh, those dividers are talking about uh, um, positive things, uh, like uh, images that are giving pleasure. Because in, that, in our time, is a time is very difficult, and so our work can be help people to be more positive than what we are in the reality. 
this is a very important because I am talking now about uh, design as a, a tool, not only to make uh, nice things well done the, in a very decorative way, but design is much more complex than that. Design can make people good mood or bad mood. Uh, design can create people enjoying the future or design can make people being reactionary, et cetera, et cetera. So design is a very powerful, uh, com uh, communication is a very important expression. And in my opinion, is an art. Mm. And I hope you have a young people listening because they, they go to school uh, usually with very bad uh, teacher because the teacher are paid uh, very little and so they are very bad. And so they don't teach what they have to teach. In reality, they have to teach that design is not the design of the grandfather 200 years ago, but design today is a very powerful meaning and way to communicate that can allow the people to talk about a very important issue, like political, like uh, religious, like uh, philosophical, et cetera, et cetera. This is what I would like to, to tell to your audience. Young people, they have to understand they are manipulating something that is an art. And more, maybe better than art. Because art is an elite product, it goes to the gallery, goes to the museum, but it stays elite. But the object and the design goes to families. They stay inside the family. People are in contact with them every minute of the day, possibly the night, and it's a very, very powerful. When I did a chair, that he was talking about women that sacrifice slave of the men. And that chair went to in thousands and thousands of copies around the world, bringing that message. We cannot continue like this. Mm. We have to stop to consider women as an object. And so it was a very strong message that design, in a certain way, con conceived as a political tool, can do. Okay, now I would like to stop, and you go. And we go with your question, uh, Glenn. Well, what I would like to do is go back, not quite to when you were eight years old, but uh, certainly when you were younger. Uh, go back first to 1967. Uh, our plan here is to go through about 10 of the projects from the whole course of your career that um, give a very strong sense of the political communicative engagement that you have had for decades and decades. And we thought it would be interesting to start with this work, which many people may not know. It's, um, you see the Italian title there, it translates as a uh, piece or performance shooting, exhibition, uh, shooting execution. And I wonder if you could share your thoughts about this and the way that you responded to the crisis of that time through this project? No, that was a, a, a performance that they did in 1967 after something dramatic happened to me. I lost my companion, who was a woman, very intelligent, very strong, who would tell me and, and teach me a lot of things. And so I, after that, she died in an accident. Uh, it was called Milena. Milena died in an accident. So I meet, I did this performance. And the work, performance was uh, a man staying in front of the people on, on, on top of a plastic. And then uh, there was like a theater with the plastic inclining under the, the, the feet of people. And then there was a shooting execution, some um, gun shooting, and then the light appear and then we see the, a man seated on a chair losing 500 liters of blood. And then the blood in this inclined plane went 
down under the feet of the audience and the audience stay up with the feet for half an hour. Mm. Uh, the interpretation of this, I don't want to talk, but uh, everybody can understand that um, this is something happening every day. Mm. Happening against minorities, happen against the individual, and mostly happen against women. And so everybody can interpret that. So and this it was in 1967. And then I repeat that in a Congress of Architecture in Finland, where I was living for a year, a long time ago. Mm. Okay, let's go on. The second question. So this, this work, um, which of course is a very strong provocative work, is very interesting to consider in relation to this famous group of furniture that you made for B&B Italia, the Up Furniture which yes. of course is inflatable uh and you had already mentioned in your introductory remarks uh gaetano that the the very indelible object from this series that we still return to again and again is uh the up five and six six being the ottoman um and you have uh, already spoken of this as an image of female liberation and i wonder if you could say more about the the design more about the object and indeed the artwork yes so it was uh, 1969 in production, and uh, it was, uh, they were selling a company called BNB. Uh, at that time, it was called B B and C CMB, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, the story of that is uh, that uh, I discovered one day taking a shower that I had a sponge and I compressed with my hand the sponge, and I saw the sponge reducing the, the volume. And then when I was leaving with my hand, the volume was coming back. So the, the chair in question was done in foam, 100% of foam, no other structure. And so I thought that, that it was good to put it uh, under vacuum. So it was sold under, in an envelope under vacuum and people was going easily with, uh, with this at home, etc. And it was a great success. But the great success also came because it was, my, for me, one of the first figurative expression. Because uh, design has no other way to go to the future if it's not changing the, the, the decorative attitude that the designer use today. And they have to understand that the future can allow the design to become a representation of a reality. Mm -hmm. So relate, relating design and reality, and reality has a lot of things to say, and design can be the interpreter of that. In the case of this chair, nine, up five and six, I already said what is the message. And so the people was happy to open the envelope and this chair was not inflated, but it was like a sponge, the, the material, itself take back the, the air and it come, it come to the end that you have, you have the, the original form. And the, the Ottoman was connected with a chain like the image of a prisoner. Uh, uh, so this is the story. And then uh, with that, because the company asked me to do certain things that was more easy to sell. I did others, other pieces. And in between, a big foot. Mm. But the big foot, uh, they asked me why I want to do that. And me, I said, because the foot is the symbol of going on. Uh, we have to always to remember that to go back is stupid. To go on is intelligent. Discovery is very important. Experiments are important. And in this way, the history can be alive. One thing you have said to me about this uh, work, Gaetano, the Up Five and Six, is that some people have interpreted, interpreted it not as a prisoner who is chained to a ball, but for example, as a mother and child. 
And you've said to me that you're quite open to those kinds of interpretations, even if they were not your intention. Yes, Glenn, you're right. In reality, the good artwork allowed people to interpret. So me, I have my interpretation. People have the right to interpret a mother and child or a sex symbol or whatever they want to, to read on that. For me, what is uh, the most important is the, the representation of the woman without freedom, which is a very visible, unfortunately, in a lot of countries in the world. Today. Certain women cannot go out in public if she is not with the men. Mm. And uh, al alone, they cannot, they cannot go out, they stay home. This is mo a monstrosity. Anyway, okay, let's go on. So this idea of introducing a political uh, disruption into the sphere of uh, commercial production uh, led very soon thereafter to this incredible project called Braccio di Ferro, which mm -hmm. sort of up yours in Italian, I guess, <laughs> like this. Yes. Um, and in that context, you made some absolutely extraordinary objects, including this lamp called Moloch. And I wonder if you yes. could this object. So the story is that Braccio di Ferro was the first comp alternative company for the new design in Italy. After that, other, other little company like Alchemia or Salsa has created something else. I forgot what it was. What it was. You mean Memphis? Uh, Memphis, etc. But the Braccio di Ferro was uh, done by Cassina, who said, uh, Cesare Cassina, who said, Gaetano, we do a company for your object because your objects are too advanced for the Cassina company. So we create a company on the side. And it was the, the, the Braccio di Ferro. Braccio di Ferro is when you do this to people. This is the Braccio di Ferro. You say, look, fuck you with your old ideas. We go on with new ideas. And so Braccio di Ferro was done for receiving product or project from interesting designer who had no the possibility to work for important companies. And so we create that. He was alive for three or four years. And me, I asked uh, two other friends to participate, uh, like Mendini was participate, Ricardo Porro, which was a, an architect from Cuba. Uh, very interesting, by the way. And he did an, a, an object too. And then when uh, Casina understood that what we were doing was interesting also for the company, that the Casina company, they closed the Braccio di Ferro. This is the story. Mm -hmm. Then Mendini, because he participated in Braccio di Ferro, and Braccio di Ferro was dead, then they opened Alchemia. And after that, uh, the Sorsas, because he arrived a little late, and then he did the, the alchemia, which is, I believe, is still around, but it's very superficial. I don't like that. I don't like decorative stuff. I don't like the superficiality. I don't like, in general, stupidity. So anyway, let's go on. There's a divergence there between what has come to be called postmodernism and the idea yeah, of... Yeah, that, that was the moment. Yeah, it's the first of that in architecture, too. People with no ideas, they go back to history to pick up ideas from history. But this is uh, something, it's like, uh, instead to make love, you masturbate. That is very bad, depressing, and you don't are satisfied with that. The history is a fantastic moment, but it's gone. And there is nothing we can, we can receive from history, except that history can tell us where we are going. Mm. That is another story too long to express. But the, usually history is a line, more or less straight. And what happened in the past is also happening with different form in the future. Mm. But next time we talk, I will explain more about this. Well, okay. Let's, let's talk about Golgotha then, which is um, perhaps the most important project that occurred at this time and in this context. And this seems like a very good opportunity to talk about using new materials for expressive purposes as well. So, of course, we have the, the table, the Golgotha table, 
and then the related chairs, which you see in detail here. But I'll just yes. go for a shot. Yeah, so the Golgotha table uh, series is very important because it's talking about um, the, the uh, religious, religious whatever. It's a resurrection representing a resurrection. Like we know in the history of the Catholic religion, there is a moment where Jesus Christ, after the cross, he resurrected. Uh, uh, me, I took this and I made this story because I believe design as a art expression can talk about the different concepts, different etc. etc. and also about religion. And so I built this table in the way that it was done upside down connecting bricks with the jackpot. The jackpot was a liquid. The liquid was going down when I was putting the bricks together. But when you turn the table because it's finished, the drops that were going down, the red drops, they become going up. And that is a representation of the resurrection. In my opinion, this is one of the most strong object or project I made. The chair, remember the sudarium, the, the linen that they covered <coughs> Jesus Christ's body after he died in the tomb. Mm. And so all together, this is a, a very good example of what design can express. Sure, you can eat on the table. Sure, you can draw, you can work, or you can do uh, using the table. But there is also something very important that design sometimes forget is the meaning. And the meaning is what I told you, usually is a meaning related to something that happened in the reality. Uh, yesterday, I was thinking that uh, uh, something very simple about culture. Culture is not going to the concert, it's not going to the, the, the exhibition, it's not going to the museum, it's not going uh, here and there. No, culture is a voice of time. And time is something that has an incredible power to direct our life. So every day, time tells us what is the symbol of the moment, what is the value of the moment, and if we are not able to follow this evolution of time, we age and we become old in the brain and we become conservative, reactionary. And people who are able to stay with time that evolve, they are always younger. Thank you. That was very beautiful. Uh, I, I want to ask you also about the way that that idea is expressed in materials. So one of the things we can say about Golgotha is that you were using the most up-to-date materials of that time and putting them in contact with this ancient story of Christ's death and resurrection. So perhaps it would help to explain how these chairs are made, for example, in that connection. Well, the chair was made in a very simple way. Is a, is a horizontal mattress. There was a kind of spray of resin. The, the mattress was done with the fiberglass and dacron. They absorbed the resin. Then the person who was supposed to make the production, they hang on, on a, a simple structure, this uh, soft uh, mattress, and uh, they give the shape of a, a chair. And then the guy itself is seated on this chair, giving the shape, giving the form. 
And in 20 minutes, the chair was becoming rigid, structurally rigid. Mm. And this is uh, the way I, they produced. So each chair was different. And that was a time when I understood that this, the industrial production was obsolete only because they were making copies, repeating everything, every object the same. And it was in 1972 when I started to think that the industrial production can be a machine to make originals and not copies, giving to people the original, like art. Mm -hmm. Art is a product that goes to someone who pay a lot to have a unique something, unique painting, unique sculpture, unique whatever, music, etc. In the case of uh, the industrial production of unique pieces, it was a, a progress because to give people with a low price something that is unique, it was a, really a progress. Mm. And Golgotha was the first example I did in this way. Golgotha chair, yes. You used the phrase the aleatory series, in other words, incorporating chance into each. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Aleatory series, yes. Let's shift to architecture and look at this project uh, from 1974, which I have to say during the conditions of the coronavirus lockdown seems just so powerful and resonant. Uh, it's called the Church of Solitude, and it's a project that you had proposed, in fact, for New York City. And I wonder if you could say a little bit about it. Uh, the story of the, the chair, the church is the church born in the typology born in a time when people were living in landscape very isolated and the chair was also a way to go to sunday to the church to listen what what was were the news because there was no radio no tv no telephone etc the isolation, they need to know what was going on around. And they went to, ch went to church also for that reason, to know through the priest what is going on in the reality. So the church has a shape of a, of a, a number of people, very large possibly, where people were going to listen, etc., etc. But today, I said, today, the, the, we are together with the others every moment. It's not, the characteristic is not any more isolation, but we are so much with the others that they arrive to broke our balls. And we need to stay alone sometime, also to think and also to, to stay with ourselves, which is very good. And, uh, and so I made this project that is an underground space where you go inside. There is no a public space, but there is a series of cells where you can stay seated, uh, whatever you want to do there, and have a moment of isolation. The contrary of what was, was going on in the Middle Age. Uh, middle age. So this is the story of this church. Is a another kind of, because between art, design and architecture there is a similitude, very close. Both they have a when they are really architecture and really design, they have a capacity to express reality. Uh, not the architecture that we see around because it's not architecture that is more buildings and nothing else is a product. But the real architecture is able to tell about life, about time, etc., etc. Mm. This um, and, project also, I think maybe people know less about what it looked like on the surface of the ground. And as I understand it, this is the, the how it would be expressed above ground rather than... Yeah, ground. the ground was uh, the entrance 
and there was a face like uh, if on the in the ground there was a person mm. and then uh, the space of this uh, church was inclined in the way that there was a, a angle of the this uh, volume coming out and taking the the light uh, from outside around that uh, fragments there were uh, ruin of the old church like arches uh, or columns etc but there was something else they want to say about this project but they forgot that they will tell it another time now i don't remember i was going Let's to, go to uh, i was going to ask you about the figurative aspect of the project because this is an early example of you using figuration in architecture which is yes yes part. yes because the design and architecture are both interested to know to know what to do in the future and i believe the only way is uh, look uh, glenn you know better than me we are in a moment of communication very powerful and we cannot uh, continue to uh, not consider that uh, as uh, our expression communication means communicate with others and abstraction that uh, is using in architecture and in design is not able to communicate anything else except uh, oh how nice is this object how nice is this uh, project in reality communication means to represent what we want to do with the form that people are able to recognize and so the communication is much stronger mm. and so at that time of this project i start to use something that people can recognize and understand the meaning of the project itself mm -hmm. yes speaking of communication um, another practice that you began in the 1970s and continue to this day is that of drawing using resin and yes. I want to you particularly about these industrial skins, which could possibly be read sometimes as self-portraits, but also have this figurative quality. Uh, can you talk about this series, please? Yes, me, I, I, I say that the only way we have, if we want to be sincere, is to express ourselves with material of our time. So I never use uh, wood, metal, etc., except I made a project with glass that came out also interesting. But in general, I am not interested in traditional material, but I am very interested in contemporary material. So if I have to do a drawing, I like to do a drawing on resin because the resin is like a paper. I can roll, I can ship uh, without problem. When I have to show the resin become flat again and like a, pa a piece of paper. And so the, the image that you are showing at the beginning, the black one is the first one I made. It's a kind of strange uh, portrait. The second is a portrait of myself. And they are very big. And I continue until today because I think uh, it's very important to recognize that our time creates things so strong like the paper the, the Egyptian discovered 5,000 years ago, mm. the papyr. So we, the papyr of today is done in resin. And the people that are against the mat synthetic material, I think they are fantastic reactionary. And they don't stop history because history we cannot stop. Also with Dan, we cannot stop history. Another, okay. another uh, project that really goes deeply into resin and what can be done with that specific material is the Pratt Chair series. Um, and it might be worth saying uh, first that the Pratt Chair is made in, an in a series of nine, from one to nine, with the formula mm -hmm. of resin changing from soft to hard. So on the right, we're seeing a number one, which is just flopped on the ground. And then as you go up the series, it gets harder and harder to the point where it becomes uncomfortable again. And I wonder if you could talk about why you approached it in that way and what the meaning of the Pratt Chair project was. This is a very important project I made, I think, in 1984. And um, 
I like to remind that, that there is a lady who enjoyed this chair, this series very much, is Jeannie, the owner of the gallery we do. I work and it's called uh, Salon. Salon 94. Jeannie Greenberg. And, oh, yeah. Greenberg, yes. Thank and uh, she liked this and uh, she writes because it is a very de deep uh, project. It's a series of objects from one to nine, the same chair with different colors, uh, sure. But the, the, form, the formula of the resin changed from one to nine. So the number one is very soft. And when we open the mold, the chair collapses, like a body without bones. And then the number two is a little more rigid, but it's not good. It will stay up by itself, and if you touch it, it goes to the floor. Number three is very unstable, but it's good for the weight of a child. Number four is start to be good for the adult, but with a lot of insecurity. And number five is okay. Number six start to be too, too rigid until number nine that is totally uncomfortable because the rigidity is too strong. So this is a very good simplification of art and design. The number one is for sure an art because it's an art to express a dramatic body without bones, like happen in the reality, etc., etc. And so, when the formula changes, it can create art or an object of design. Mm -hmm. This is interesting, and everybody who is listening can think about this. Uh, strange to say, an object can be art following the chemical company, a uh, chemical uh, formula, or being an, a, 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 a design object, always form, uh, fo following the formula of the material. Mm. Would you say that you were making fun of the idea that art and design are different through this project by saying essentially, if I change the formula of the resin, then we have art instead of design? which me, me, to me seems like a kind of mockery of the distinction. Yes, uh, it could be also uh, this interpretation, but uh, something I didn't say, around the object, around the chair, there are symbol very well clear, clear uh, who says uh, what is, uh, what difficulty there are if someone want to do an innovative chair. So sometimes it's the act of love. Sometimes we do that because um, is a, we make money with that. Sometimes uh, is a we, to do a chair. We need to know a, 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 a mathematical company, a mathematical formula. So to have a different kind of knowledge to make a chair, it's not easy. Chair is a structure very complex mm. and uh, better than a building. A building, we know very well how it can stay up, but the chair is a building where a huge weight sits every moment in different way. And so is a, a structure who is able to keep this uh, huge body to move around and staying up. Mm. So the chair is a fantastic exercise if someone wants to do it. There's also tremendous diversity, internal diversity in the series because of the change of the painterly color. And of course, again, the yes, 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 yes. Um, but uh, also let, let's talk about something to the, your audience. Try to hate repetition. Repetition is uh, something who is against life. When you repeat every day, your life is very poor. If your day is different, then is a life very rich. Mm. This is a project, very important architecture, where I try to explain something about non-repeating. Mm -hmm. If we take a skyscraper that New York is full, uh, Manhattan is full, 
or those, they are repeating the floor, I don't know how many times. If I take this image of a facade where each floor is repeated and I transfer in a political reading, I have an image of a very, very rigid dictatorship. It's a very authoritarian image. And one day I said, we have to have the capacity to change every day, every floor, because in each floor, there are different people living. This is true for an office building. This is true for a living tower, for apartments. And so I did this project that I was not able until today, thank you, until today to be realized. But if it's not me, someone else will do it because it's a very important step that architecture can go through. Today we have a technology that has uh, nothing to do with the repetition. In the past, the repetition was less expensive. Today, repetition is uh, as expensive as uh, non-repeating. And so we can do a, a fantastic example of architecture that is political because this is an image of democracy. In reality, is the title is uh, uh, the, the pluralist tower. And pluralism is another name for democracy, as you know. Let's look at a project that was realized and again extends the same ideas, which is the astonishing organic building, which is in Osaka in Japan. Uh, yes. which really introduced the idea of a living wall to the city. Um, I'm not sure mm -hmm. how many people know that you invented that also, but I think you deserve credit for it. Um, can you talk a little bit about this project and how you approached it and its realization in Japan? Uh, this project was done for a client in Osaka that he was a Chinese uh, uh, client. And um, he sent me a letter saying, look, let's do an office building where you have a carte blanche, you can do whatever you want. And me, I didn't do nothing uh, more than something that I believe was very important, to have a, a vertical garden. Vertical garden was an invention of the time because the technology allowed us to have plants or trees in the facade with the, with the water that goes through computer every night by the quantity they need each plants, et cetera, or trees, et cetera. And uh, in reality, when we do garden, garden is necessary to the city. But unfortunately, the, 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 the surface of the city, the ground of the city is very expensive. We cannot make uh, uh, gardens. And so I said, if I, we do garden on the facade, it's not expensive is a garden in any way, and the city can enjoy it to have this view in vertical. In the reality, happened that we realized this, and the city of Osaka is paying the maintenance because they consider this useful for the city. And for me, it was a very good uh, um, experience. And then I know that a lot of architects or a lot of whatever, they are following this today, making garden everywhere. Very good, by the way. Here is the, the, the yes. foyer of the organic building. And this is very interesting to see how you use the palette of materials in this interior, because it's right around the same time that you did the Chiat Day offices, which is another yes. really groundbreaking project of this time. I wonder if you would talk about this idea of the network or open office that you innovated in this project. Uh, this gives me the opportunity to say that you cannot do innovation if you have not a good client. Jay Chayat was a, a brain, was a person thinking. He had an advertising company and he was a very questioning person like we are supposed to be. And he came to me because uh, he saw an apartment that I made on Park Avenue 
for a, a crazy lady called uh, Ruth Schumann. And um, I did an apartment for her as a, as a portrait of this person that is uh, very curious. And the, the woman living with Jay at that time visited the apartment and then she told to the, to the uh, husband that she saw something that he was supposed to see. And so Jay came to see the apartment and he decided to give me the offices in New York, new offices. Me in New York uh, uh, and um, the guy in uh, Los Angeles, what's the name, the guy from Toronto? Uh, you mean Frank Gary? Frank, uh, Frank, Frank was uh, doing the offices in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And uh, me, me with the Jay, I collaborate very well because he was a person understanding and the idea that an uh, office today, because the technology is an office where you are not supposed to stay always in the same place. You are not supposed to, to have paper. So it was an office with no paper and not st static uh, position of the employees. It was more a, a kind of saloon where you go because you like to go and where you meet, you can invite your friends. You can have a sandwich, you can have a drink, and you can work in the same time. You can also sleep when you're tired, because they were beautiful sofa. And the, the idea was that in the morning, you go to the office, you have a computer portable, you have a portable telephone, and, you, and then you go following your mood, near a window or not near the window, et cetera, et cetera. Hmm. And uh, it was very successful. And, and, and be sure there were a lot of reactionary who criticized that. But the New York Times with Mouchon, it was a very interesting and intelligent, for one time, intelligent journalist. He was uh, enjoying it very much. Anyway. Then there was a crisis in 19, 2008, and so the company need to reduce the personnel, and then uh, they, they move from there, and they, that was the finish of this uh, office. How they call that office? They, they have a name, but I forgot the name. Okay. This was the, not the office state static, in a little space with a desk, not the landscape office, but it was a open space where you move around and you don't have always the boring obligation to stay always in the same moment, in the same place. It was a great, great moment because uh, me, I didn't have a lot of intelligent clients. But the Jay Chayat, he was a very good guy, very good guy. A guy who used the brain, and he's very rare. Okay, let's go. Well, I think w what we'll do now is actually turn to questions, if that's okay with you, Gaetano, because we have many of them. I do want to just show people uh, the last thing that you did in terms of a public project, which is the working gallery that you did with Salon 94, the gallery you mentioned. Yes where you actually displaced your studio into the gallery's space and allowed people to come and watch you work, which was an extraordinary experience. And uh, you had also mentioned um, a little while ago the foot from the Up series, and I did want to show the foot in, <laughs> in, your, in your own studio, just so people see what that looks like in the incredible, rich uh, atmosphere and environment of your creativity. And it's great that you're able to continue that uh, production and invention at home. Uh, but with that, I think we'll go to questions, if that's okay with you, Gaetano? Absolutely. Great, let's, let's get the audience involved. We had quite a few questions in advance, and I thought we might start with you, Max. Uh, I see you there on the screen. So you had a few questions. I was particularly interested in your question about Gaetano's advice for his younger self. <laughs> so I thought that was a great question, but please ask anything you'd like. Uh, hey. Yes. No. Um, oh no. Yes, you're. you're we can hear you. Okay. Um, this is uh, Max. I'm. I'm from uh, Vancouver in Canada. Um. Yeah, I had a couple questions, but one. 
you know, ref hearing you talk about the idea of time and talking about, um, you know, the, the how boring it is to stay in the same place. Um, I was curious what your kind of, ex if, if you could say anything to, if you could go back in time and have a conversation with the 30 year old version of yourself, I'm curious what sort of advice or vision you, you could offer to him. Max, it's a very impossible to answer to your question because I am 80 years old, I am not anymore 30, and I have no idea what I was thinking when I was 30. Trying to answer to you, uh, uh, if I look back to my life, I think uh, if I have to repeat for once, more or less I repeat it. I don't regret anything. I experiment anything I thought was possible. Also something that it was difficult to experiment and I was, uh, I survived to that. And so I don't regret anything. I have no suggestion except uh, one thing. Pay attention to time. Max, pay attention to time. Every moment it tell you something. And the great reactionary don't pay attention to the sign of time. And so they provoke a delay on developing society. And there are full of idiots today that they stop evolution of the world. Hmm. We have too many of those. You are young and fight against reactionary. Other people call them fascist. Now fascist uh, today is, a re is, a re re is not very common because it's a very deep, horrible thing. There are not a lot, unfortunately, like that. But there are a lot of reactionary. Try to be not like them. Like, uh, this is my recommendation. Okay. So. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Max, for your question and Gaetano for that powerful answer. Uh, we have a similar or related question from Ana Laura Fornassier, who has a question about the materials that you use. Ana Laura, are you listening? Any chance? Uh, I'll go ahead and ask the question for her. I'm not sure that we have her. Um, hi. Oh, oh hi. Yeah. hi. Hi. Laura. Great. Sorry. I couldn't <laughs> unmute myself. <laughs> go, go <right. laughs> uh, <laughs> Ciao Gaetano, hi. Ciao um, Laura. Um, Laura, you look uh, like a daughter of my, uh, my sister. <laughs> Are you Italian? Yes, I'm from near Venice. Ah, you see? Incredible. <laughs> okay, let's uh, go. I study at the Royal College of Art in uh, London and um, I've been working with the polyurethane foam this year. So my question is, uh, you say that uh, we should uh, express ourselves with the materials of our time. Do you think uh, polyurethane, for example, is still a material of our time? Or should we seek for something more natural or an alternative that is more sustainable? Because clearly polyurethane isn't sustainable. Yeah, Laura, can I tell you that uh, what we call non-natural is natural in reality because it comes from the hair. Petrol, petrol is uh, natural, it's down on the earth. We take out the like we take out from a, a fruit. And so when people say this is artificial, no, it's not artificial. But in any way, also if it's artificial, it's done by the human being. And the human being usually, they do fantastic things that I call progress. If without that, imagine that in the time of electricity, when someone discovered the electricity, and there was someone saying, no, but the electricity is, is dangerous because a child can put the tongue in the, in the, outlet. In the outlet and then it can die. So, and they decided to, to stop the use of electricity because that, imagine where we were, 
today, where we are today for the tourism. We are in a very obscure time. So when you know someone who tells that kind of things about uh, not using the material of our time, go away because they are sick and they are contagious, like uh, the, the Chinese, uh, how you call it? Vi virus that we have today. Go away. Don't stay with those people. Laura, is a okay. good suggestion or not? Yes. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. Thank nice you. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. One other question that we had in advance was from Aura Latore. Uh, Aura, are you th out there? It's a very simple question. Um, maybe I'll just go ahead and say th the question is what criticisms have been made of your work? At, over the course of your career? Look, uh, I w in my life, I was always uh, with no money. And I made the uh, jumping here and there to uh, be uh, able to do what I did. And some, I remember an Italian, no, a French critic looking to my work, he said, how is possible that someone with no money, did what you did. No, you 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 ask around. When you are not, with, when you have no money, ask around. And if you ask around, there is always someone who answers, yes, I trust you, I help you, etc. And I was able to have uh, people like that quite a lot in my life who helped me to do what I had in mind. Uh, my family was a family without father because my father died when I was eight years old, no, eight, uh, eight months old. My mother was a pianist and with the pianist we don't make money. So we were very poor. But in the meantime, we were able to survive very well. And uh, there is this story I like to, to repeat because I repeat all the time this story that my mother one day around the table having lunch and talking about our situation. We were three brother and sister and, uh, and my mother. And my mother said something that uh, was fantastic. Like, uh, we are rich and one day we have money. And this was uh, something that happened to me. And it was fantastic. Okay. Anyway. Thank you. Um, Alessandra Pilner uh, has a very interesting question about your early experiences uh, and involvement in the protests of the 1960s. Alessandra, are you, are you there? I am. I was having troubles unmuting myself as well. <laughs> that's, my, that's my background for my work. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Ciao, Alessandra. Ciao. <laughs> Well, I have a question for you. I'm curious how, in retrospective, you think that the student protests in the 60, 60s had an impact on your work. And in retrospective, if the student protests would not have happened, would your practice today look differently? And can I just say, um, just to contextualize the question, for those that don't know, Gaetano was very involved in protests in Venice. Uh, in fact, flew a flag from the top of the tower in San Marco Square at one occasion, and also was in Paris in 1968 when those protests were in their um, peak moment. So uh, I really wonder about that too, Gaetano. What impact do you think those experiences had on your artwork? Alessandra, what Glenn said is true. Uh, in in Paris, in the, during 68, I was in jail for seven days. And then the people where I was working, the, the magazine I was working for L, the lawyer of L, they did the necessary to allow me to leave the, the jail. But I was always, something interesting maybe to say is, I was never protesting with others. I was protesting alone. Uh, in San Marco Square, I was alone in front of a certain number of police. 
that they were trying to catch me, but they were not able, finally. But there, is, there are pictures done by a famous photographer where I am alone in front of those policemen. But finally, uh, following that time, there was a, a great mind who told me something that I, at the time I was not able to understand. This was a poet, and he was also a movie director called Pierpaolo Pasolini, a great mind, who said once in the 68, she said, the people protesting are the bourgeois. The police are simple people with no money, very little, and they do a very horrible job. And if you are, he said, Pasolini, if you ask on what side I am, I am on the side of the police. When I was reading that, that opened my mind. When I was protesting, I was protesting as a privileged person against people that they have no privilege. So I think, uh, Alexandra, you are young. Think about that. And then at the end, uh, you will maybe know where you are. Well, I can't imagine a better note to end it on. Um, Gaetano, we have many more questions that we can answer, unfortunately, in our short time, but this has been an extraordinary experience to share this time with you and to learn about your work and your history, but above all your ideas. And uh, we really, really thank you from the bottom of our heart. It's been fantastic to listen to you. Glenn, you are one of the rare